Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of the day it happens to be while you're watching. For those who don't know, my name is Matt Doyle. I'm a UK-based author and occasional voice actor. And today we are on the second episode of my Cabinet of Curios, where we'll be looking at horror media that is a little bit obscure, a little bit weird, or sometimes just a little bit underrated. So today we're going to be looking at Outcast. So, Outcast is a 2010 um, British horror film set in Scotland. It's directed by Colm McCarthy, who primarily works on TV. Um, Long-time fans of British television would know him from everything from Footballer's Wives and Hustle through to Doctor Who and, more recently, The Bastard Son and the Devil himself. Uh, the story is actually set in Edinburgh, and it follows Mary and her son Fergal. Uh, they've been on the run for a, a long time and are using magic to hide and protect themselves, while a killer named Cathal is hunting them down. As Cathal starts to draw near, people in the local area begin to die at the hands of an unknown beast, and then it all builds up into a crescendo where it kind of pulls everything together. Now, the cast in this one is very strong. Um, a lot of them will be familiar to long-time fans of British television as well as movies. Um, yeah, Cathal, in particular, I was very impressed with. He's played by James Nesbitt, who rose to fame in the UK in the mid-90s uh, for the romantic comedy series Cold Feet. Outside that, people tended to know him from the film Waking Ned. Um, he's played Bofa in the Hobbit films more recently, and he did a while back have a slightly darker role where he played uh, the titular character in Jekyll. Uh, that one's actually a short-run series. It's a sort of modernised sequel to the classic tale of uh, Jekyll and Mr Hyde. The mother in this film, Mary, is played by Kate Dickey. Um, you may know her from Tinseltown or Game of Thrones. Uh, you may even know her as Catherine, the mother in The Witch, if you're a fan of more sort of folky horror. Uh, the Laird is played by veteran actor James Cosmo. I mean, he's appeared in like, Sons of Anarchy, Game of Thrones, The Highlander, uh, The Lion, The Witch in the Wardrobe. The monster itself is played by Ian White, who played various predators in the AVP films. And there's even a brief appearance by a young Karen Gillan, um, who, of course, has been in like, Oculus and Doctor Who and all sorts of things like that. Now, as to what the film is, I would describe it as a perfectly fine example of what happens when you take an urban fantasy style story setting, but lean away from the romance and more into the horror. See, I, I love urban fantasy. I you know I make no qualms about that. But I, you do find that you get some horrific moments in there, and there's a lot of like flash and magic and shapeshifters and so on, and it crosses over quite a lot with pure paranormal romance. This does not. In particular, I think this is well illustrated by the magic system in play. Now, if you hear magic and people hunting people down and using magic to protect themselves, and your immediate thought is there's going to be a lot of flash and bang and mystical battles, you would be completely wrong. Absolutely and completely wrong. Uh, if anything, it, the magic system here is very understated. Uh, it's very subtly done. Uh, Mary and Fergal are part of a race of Celtic people with a natural affinity for magic, whereas... Cathal is a normal human. He actually goes to some of Mary's people um, and makes a deal to be temporarily imbued with some of their power by getting some tattoos done in that sort of like old school tapping way, right? And then he gets a guide in the form of Liam who kind of shows him around and shows him how the rituals work and gives him advice and introductions as he's going on. But this, as I say, is all done very subtly, um, and it is very dark. And when I mean subtle, I do purely mean as to how the magic itself is portrayed. The ritual themselves are a little bit more in your face. Um, you see, like, a couple of times, Cathal very graphically sort of taking a knife to like, sacrifice a bird uh, to do some tracking. Um, there's a lot of nude rituals performed, you know, if you ever saw the mother in The Witch and thought, I wonder what she looks like in the nip, you get nothing left to the imagination in this film. Same as if you saw Cold Feet and thought, I haven't seen enough of James Nesbitt's wang dangling about. You're going to be sorted in this film. Um, there is even a very graphic bit where Cathal is trying to talk to the dead and he has to like take a knife and like 
cut the skin away from his neck and it's no holds barred in what it shows you with that but in terms of like actual flash and things like that it only really happens the once uh, sort of more towards the end of the movie there's some symbols that light up on the wall and because it's not overdone it kind of feels fitting for what's happening at that point in the film right it, it's kind of it, it feels like it's right for that moment but the rest of it it all feels like it's very rooted in older mythology. You could really picture this as something being portrayed from a Christian perspective, you know? Maybe like an illustration uh, being drawn of a witch with um, accompaniments to warn people from the church, you know, and say, look out for these people, and there'd be embellishments of a demonic creature sort of guiding the magic user. You know, the system feels very old, and... I, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of it was based on some old rituals from the past. And that all helps create a sense of darkness rooted in reality for the movie, which in itself actually expands to the design of the beast. Now, I'd like to make a point here, because I came across this film um, for another project. See, I have a tentatively titled project called Project Awu going on, um, because I'm obviously somewhat of a masochist um because i've decided to try and collect every werewolf movie still in existence on physical media i currently own more than a hundred and yes i have watched them and yes that is about as variable in quality as you would imagine whether this film is actually a werewolf movie though is kind of up for debate the poster uses a layout that is kind of common with werewolf movies with that clawed hand down the side and the person in the distance and even in the some of the dvd covers you'll see like the the human and then the shadow coming off them with the beast sort of in the shadow and it looks very werewolf, but at the same time, I have seen a particular Claude Hand one used a couple of times for Sasquatch films as well. Uh, the DVD menu, if you go to the extras, there is a silhouette on the wall, which looks a lot more wolf-like than the actual beast design. Um, that in itself should tell you that this probably is a werewolf movie, uh, because werewolf movies have an awful habit of showing designs for werewolves on the official art for the movie that had no resemblance whatsoever to the actual design. Case in point, if you look at uh, Among the Shadows, uh, Werewolf in England and Carnivore, all three use the same piece of stock art and all three of them have a werewolf design in the movie which is absolutely nothing like it. Um, most notably Among the Shadows is the furthest from it of all three of them but if you look at the cover for among the shadows and you immediately think is that an asylum mockbuster for underworld it's not it's really not but it's not by asylum but having watched it i could absolutely picture some a small team in a studio sitting down and saying hey those underworld movies are pretty popular still aren't they at the moment aren't they someone called lindsay lohan we're going to do our own version with a quarter of the budget and half the effort I mean, that sounds up your alley and you're happy to see it cheap in the wild. By all means, buy it. Give it a watch. There's a only a 90% chance that you'll be severely disappointed. I'd say there's actually a much higher possibility, maybe about 95%, uh, but you won't be disappointed with Outcast. So the beast itself uh, looks to me more like a... I, I suppose a orc and a hunchback combined. That's not to mean that there isn't hints at it being intended to be a werewolf, though. Um, there's a very scene very early on, um, after we see Fergal leaning at the car window, somewhat like a dog taking in the air. And it, it's only a minor spoiler to say that Fergal is the beast. I, I think that's made very clear from the get-go that that is the beast that Cathal is hunting and that he is only allowed to kill the beast, no one else. Um immediately after that there's a shot of um another minor character watching a cartoon about werewolves so i think the intent is there if you disagree it's the werewolf movie that you know that's entirely valid too and you could just take it as a shape-shifting beast it's not going to change the story um because the idea of it being a werewolf isn't entirely important to what they're trying to get at here the main thing is, though, for me, the design of the creature, um, 
because it looks like a stretched, sort of elongated, deformed human look, it kind of fits with that world of magical realism that I think they were going for. You know, it is dark, but you can tell this is something that was human, but at the same time is out there enough visually. Um, I am, other than that bit with Fergal, I'm going to try to avoid too many spoilers with this one, um, just because I feel like some of the twists are integral in enjoying this film. You are likely to see a lot of them coming a mile off. They're not exactly hard to figure out. And, you know, sometimes that I knew it moment is actually gratifying in a movie I find, so I'm not too worried about that. There are some little bits that you may not guess, um, and even those bits that you won't guess, my God, they are a dreary bunch of story beats. Um, we are, at times with this movie, uh, heading firmly into Alien 3, territory with uh with the darkness this is not a happy tale at all um not even a little bit there isn't a clear good guy you know even the ones that we're supposed to be rooting for whether at the start you're throwing your lot in with cathal or mary and fergal none of them are purely good there are varying degrees of bad guy though um taking cathal as an example he is hunting a monster but the official description of the film declares him a killer so you know he isn't truly a hero his guide Liam knows exactly what kind of man cathal is but he helps him anyway Mary is protecting her child, which is a noble thing, as we discussed with Gorgo, but at the same time she's very overbearing and very controlling towards him, and there are some creepy moments that leak in through that. Fergal is maybe the most uh, sort of sympathetic we get, in that he's a teenager trying to find his way, but at the same time he's so deeply ingrained in how he's been brought up that he really seems unsure about how to deal with pretty much everything that comes his way um especially when it pertains to new experiences for him which is where the character of petronella comes in uh, she's a mixed race girl from the housing estate that fergal now lives in and is the catalyst for fergal taking the risks that, are that kind of eventually re lead to that final crescendo you know she's uh subject to racism she's stuck looking after her disabled brother because her mum is you know a terrible drunk um she wants to escape at all but she feels trapped and in Fergal, she has a fellow trapped soul that is less adept at living than her in a sense. While you could argue that Petronella isn't really a bad character, she does lead Fergal astray somewhat, which leads to a lot of the trouble happening for them. Um, you know, when I said this leans into horror more than romance, there is a romance that kind of blossoms between Fergal and Petronella but it's not romance in the traditional sense you know this you can tell from the start this isn't going to get a happily ever after their story is really more about how bloody terrifying it can be to grow up sometimes you know they're 15 but they hang out at the local park and play on the swings and that is a very common thing in the UK teenagers who at one point would have wanted nothing more than to be treated as adults now that they're within touching distance of that they go back to the places that they played as kids because they really want to hang on to that, right? Even the ones that do the things like getting the swings or throwing them and tying them up around the top of the frame, they're probably doing it as an attempt to appear rebellious and avoid acknowledging that they really just want to have fun again. But grow up, they must. And, you know, movies like Ginger Snaps and A Company of Wolves use the idea of the werewolf as a metaphor for puberty outcast i don't think does i think it deals with this a little bit more directly the adults view them as children very much they view 15 year olds as children because they are children but they're also inconsistent in how they treat them you know fergal and petronella are teenagers that under uk law are yes than a, less than a year away from the age of consent they're aware of attraction and desire and they find enough common ground together that they're willing to embrace that with each other you know this is symbolically their way of growing up when they do physically embrace in the film it it also happens at the playground at night you know when they decide to run away together petronella wants to meet at the same playground maybe as a way to represent moving on from childish things so throughout this we have this this sort of mixed symbology that they are wanting to grow up 
they know that they should be growing up but at the same time the playground is there being used as this i suppose this representation of the fact that they they aren't fully grown up and in a lot of ways this shares um in a way i suppose it shares a bit in common with the 2003 drama film 13 which um it's a marvelous film um absolutely disturbing for me uh because i first watched it while my my little sister was 13 and she was he had a friend very similar to the friend that leads the um the lead character astray in that so that was terrifying for me um but it's it's a similar setup because in both those films they're families who are not well off they have past traumas to deal with and the teenagers are in a state of limbo between childhood and adulthood they're not getting the support that they want from the parents due to the circumstances they find themselves in even if the parents are making mistakes but are generally well meaning and as a result they slide into what they view as adulthood even though doing so only leads to more issues in both films there's a fallout to be had for those still standing at the end the main difference is in 13 people aren't dead <laughs> you know <laughs> they're in a bad place but they are alive to learn from this in outcast death is the consequence for everyone who doesn't make it to the final scene they um yeah the body count is is quite high in terms of named characters for this one um so if you like dreary films where very few people are going to make it out alive i i, I would say this is a good one for you so where does that leave outcast overall there are other little things that we could touch on here um there's like things like the significance in the way cathal addresses fergal later in the film um and bits like that but it would stray a little further into spoiler territory than i want to go um so it said I, i'm going to summarize it like this whether or not outcast is a werewolf movie isn't really important what matters is that it is a damn fine movie um it holds a very dreary mirror to a realistic setting and the magic that would light up other films is shown to be a dangerous dark path to walk here it, it isn't inherently evil but it certainly casts more of a shadow than light the people both good and bad are all flawed and broken and very few of them make it out alive you might find it oh, hard to wholeheartedly root for anyone in the film but equally you may find yourself being drawn enough to watch them all fall with a morbid fascination in this one because i think that's one of the film's strongest points this isn't a film to watch for a happily ever after this is one to watch things fall apart and fall apart it really does from a point where things are already falling apart at the start of the film it's not going to be for everyone it is slow moving um you don't see the beast much at all until the very end of the movie which i know some people prefer to see the monster more than that um the nude scenes again are gonna be fine for some people not fine for others uh the things of the 15 year olds growing up because there you know there is a physical intimacy uh between them shown in the movie that may be a step too far for some i mean it is it's an awkward watch in that respect at the same time i think it is worth acknowledging that obviously two 15 year olds nearing the age of 16 in the uk um who are both suffering but have an instant attraction to each other you know it's possibly going to happen right but again it may make the film a difficult watch for you which is absolutely fine um if it's one that you do want to check out though i believe it is available on tubi in america um i'm not sure if it's available to stream in the uk uh my my copy is on dvd you can pick that up in cex for a couple of quid you know it's it's not expensive but you know that's that's i think about all i really want to say about this one it's it's definitely an interesting one it's one that i would class as one of the better werewolf movies for me because i do class it as a werewolf movie um it's got a great cast they all do a great job and the dreary dark story is something that you know really appeals to me so for me it was kind of a win on all parts 
But if you have seen Outcast, let me know in the comments below what you thought of it. And if you haven't seen it, maybe give it a shot. So, until next time. Later.